There's a great show on Netflix that my wife and I enjoy about a group of kids in a small town in Indiana who discover a portal to an, an alternate version of their hometown that they refer to as the Upside Down. The Upside Down is, a, is structurally like their hometown of Hawkins, Indiana, but it's putrid and hellish and fiery and infested with monsters that want to destroy the real world or reality. There's only been four seasons of this show with a fifth season due next year, but in the first season, a boy goes missing because he's he's trapped in the Upside Down and everyone fights to rescue him from this dark underworld. But as the seasons progress, the real world in Hawkins, Indiana, is progressively corrupted by this other realm of evil, horror, and destruction. Art is always reflective and indicative of cultural reality. Never forget that. Even if it's the artist's intention to offer a critique of something, it's still illustrative of reality. Well, the Upside Down from Stranger Things is really the perfect metaphor for American society today. Our people and our institutions have progressively been corrupted by this dark dimension that we would describe as the spiritual force or forces of wickedness, which is spearheaded by the god of this world, Satan, or the devil. He's labeled in scripture as the adversary because he's opposed to God and humanity. He hates you, and he hates God. He's known as the deceiver and the father of lies, which he's accomplished with even the very first humans to exist. He's even an enemy of, of righteousness, and, and he's the great tempter who not only seeks to lead you astray from holiness and obedience to God, he even attempted to do so with the Son of God himself when Jesus was beginning his ministry in the wilderness. He's known as the accuser, he's the prince of darkness, and he's the destroyer, the roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. It's no coincidence that these characteristics of Satan are the characteristics of American society as we've become progressively adversarial to God and human life, we're immersed in deception, which we'll talk a lot about today. We're opponents to righteousness and holiness. We perpetuate the, the orders and decrees of the Prince of Darkness. We're giving into every temptation, being so easily ensnared. And we're destroying everything that is godly and good. Therefore, much of the world, but especially in America, we're, we're living in the upside down. Upside down is, is the perfect literary phrase or metaphorical phrase because it's the opposite of right side up. That is to say that things have been just turned over, toppled over. Things are the opposite of what they should be. So if I were to reduce everything to simple phrasing, what's true is considered false and what's false is deemed to be true. What's beautiful is now considered ugly, and what's ugly is paraded as beautiful. What is moral is now immoral or amoral. What is actually good has been twisted into evil, and what is evil is celebrated as good. Positives or negatives, highs or lows, empty is full, big is small, and hot is cold. Everything is upside down, and you'll see what I mean today, if not every week. The progression into the upside down has manifested itself in so many ways in our society. It's symptomatic in our mainstream media, in the entertainment industry, in the medical field, in science, in academia and education, in the people's government, in our justice system, in family life, and yes, even in our churches. All of our core institutions, and, and the most important ones, have been all but destroyed by the upside down. But the Christian is not to hopelessly abandon the battle before us. I know that it's easy to feel hopeless and just throw up your hands and say, this is just how it's going to be. And you probably also feel at times that things just get worse and worse and worse. Nothing is getting better. But hold on just a second. 
To give up is, is just to ignore the commands of our Lord, who implored us to be the salt and light of the earth. And there's, there's nothing new under the sun. That's what the Bible says. There have been times which were significantly worse than now. I know it's hard to believe that, but it just feels like it's worse now because we live in the age of information when we know everything about everything. We forget, though, the, the awfulness of history with world wars and famine, etc. And truthfully, this is the worst that things have ever been in our country's relatively short history. So it's important that we understand uh, all of this, not to lose heart and to take heart. We have a fight to fight and a, and a race to finish because it ain't over till it's over. So what can we do or what should we do? Last week I talked about how incredibly binary everything is in the world and in spirituality. And I know I'll be criticized for being so so very black and white about everything. But the older I get, the more I realize that there isn't much that actually exists in the gray. You have the duality of, of God, the God of the universe versus the God of this world, you know, the, the Lord and, and Satan. They represent the pinnacles of these differentiations. God represents light and life and goodness and freedom holiness, beauty, truth, and spirit. Satan, on the other side, the adversary, represents darkness, death, evil, slavery, sin, ugliness, and filth, falsehood, and flesh. And they are diametrically opposed. There's not a third camp. There is no gray existence. You either exist in the darkness or you're walking in the light of life. And practically everything we do pushes us toward one place or the other. This is perfectly illustrated by Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 5. He encouraged them, starting in verse 16, to walk in the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Already there you can see the duality. The two things opposed to one another. The Spirit, which, was, which is with a capital S, versus the flesh. And he's going to explain what that means in just a moment. He, he continues by saying, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Capital S. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please or that your flesh desires. The first thing you may note is that there is no existence of a third existence. You're in one place or the other. You're either living according to the Holy Spirit or you're satiating the desires and whims of your own flesh. There is no in-between. There's no existence where you can be in both places at once. And just for clarity, part of this duality is the, is the division between the two realms which coexist for the time being. The physical realm, which is everything that is created and material, and the spiritual, our souls, spirits, the, the, the eternal things, the forces of, of good and evil. You, in fact, exist as a binary being. You're both a body and a soul. You're, the fancy word for this is hylomorphic, which means you're composed of uh, corporeal and, and spiritual matter. So becoming a Christian, or one who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, whose soul belongs to the Lord, that doesn't mean that our desire to sin or to satisfy the flesh disappears because we're momentarily trapped in fallen bodies. And, and Paul is illustrating this tug of war that as a believer in a sinner's body, you'll be tempted to walk according to the flesh. But, he says, if you will walk in the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Well, next, Paul draws this line straight down the middle and lists some examples for us. Here's what it looks like to live according to the flesh, and, and, and then here's what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. Take a look at it. In verse 19, Paul says, 
the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. He listed 15 things. And no, this, this isn't an exhaustive list, which is why he said in things like these, dot, dot, dot. Listen to me very closely. This is what life is like in the upside down. The very first thing he lists is immorality. And this is the word pornaya, which is the Greek from which we get our word for pornography. So this is talking about being sexually immoral. Truly, it speaks to the glorification of sex as an idol, which we've talked a lot about lately. Remember, there's basically nothing which exists in the gray. So there's only sexual morality and sexual immorality. There is whatever God's moral requirements are for sexuality, and everything else is opposed to this. It's incredibly simple to understand when you, when you have that basic binary understanding. God's word illustrates with utmost clarity that sexual morality is defined as one man and one woman who are married to each other for life. Anything, anything external to that is pornaya. Okay? That doesn't just mean that homosexuality or bisexuality and, and transgenderism, that's, that's not it. To be sexually immoral also means to be adulterous, polyamorous, lustful, etc. It's anything that is outside of that sexual relationship between one man and one woman for life. Okay, I could talk about this all day, but this is just one of the central plagues of America's upside down. Paul lists impurity, which is uncleanness or to be defiled. And there's other ways to be impure outside of sexual immorality. You can, you can feed yourself impure content, which corrupts your heart and mind. You can physically feed yourself garbage, which is unclean for the temple of your body. Not only can your thoughts be defiled, but our words can be as well. In the upside down, people load their hearts and minds and their mouths and stomachs with all sorts of impurity. Sensuality is sometimes translated as lewdness or licentiousness. This is being indecent, unrestrained, or uselessly violent, ready to sin at the drop of a hat. There's no sense of shame or embarrassment in sin. These flaunt their immorality. You could say they demonstrate great pride in their sin. This is what it's like to live according to the flesh, and this is the way that it is in the upside down. Idolatry is something that we've talked a lot about lately. It means to place anything above God. And this is incredibly easy to do, as we've seen. Mostly, we worship ourselves, and we become our own gods and goddesses. But in doing so, we worship all sorts of things in the American upside down. Success, sexuality, celebrity, wealth, fitness, etc. There is no such thing as an irreligious person because every single person that existed, that exists now, and, and that is yet to exist, will worship something. And in the upside down, idolatry sits on the throne. In fact, this is where all sin begins, really. Lucifer's fall had to do with idolatry. Adam and Eve's First sin had to do with idolatry, and all of our sin begins with idolatry. The next word, sorcery, is actually related to idolatry in that it has to do with spiritual sorcery or what has been called like dark magic. So the historical context was using hallucinogenic drugs for spirituality. No, this doesn't mean that you can't enjoy Harry Potter, but it basically means not to get high on drugs. I mean, that is to satiate the flesh and to immerse oneself into an incredibly vulnerable state, 
mentally, physically, and spiritually. Drug use is a surefire way to take up residence in the Upside Down. Enmity is to hate or to be hostile to an enemy because the Upside Down is a hateful place. Strife could mean either to have a contentious spirit, like you're just ready for a fight, or you're literally fighting or quarreling all the time. Jealousy is to be hostile toward a rival, to want so badly what someone else has. And the Greek word was actually onomatopoeic in that saying the word sounded like boiling water. So it conveys this burning emotion, boiling over from heat. This is what it's like to live according to the flesh. And this is the way that it is in the Upside Down. Outbursts of Anger describes the the carnally short fuse or wrath. I think disputes is actually a poor translation of the Greek erytheia or erytheia. Um, This word basically means selfish ambition. And around this time, the word was used to describe, no kidding, Politicians who were just campaigning to win an election with zero intention of actually serving their constituents. It was all just about their own benefit and power and profit. William Barclay described dissensions as a society where members fly apart instead of coming together. And the word literally means standing apart. But it speaks to divisions which wrongly separate people into pointless factions Factions, which is the next word, it speaks to discord and contention. Envying speaks to having grudges or such strong feelings that it begins to sour. It pushes you into sin to the point where you'd be glad to see misfortune or pain befall someone. This is what it's like to live according to the flesh. And this is the way that it is in the Upside Down. Drunkenness is the Greek methe. And it simply means to be intoxicated. Drunkenness doesn't mean that you're a binge-drinking alcoholic. The biblical text defines it as intoxication. Plato even used it that way. The question then is, what qualifies intoxication? Is it, is it a legal limit that's established by society? Well, if we take the word at face value, then any inebriation or impairment would qualify as biblical drunkenness. And this relates to the next word, carousing, or another word is revelries. This is talking about wild parties or a person who is like a party animal. It's just wild partying, and and these are surely fueled by some of the preceding carnalities in this list. And that's what it's like to live according to the flesh. And, And this is the way that it is in the Upside Down. Now, don't miss this. You cannot forget that Paul is writing this to Christians, uh, or at least those who profess to be followers of Christ, those that belonged to that church in Galatia. And that's why he gives them this warning. He writes that, that list, that listful lifestyle according to the flesh, and then he says this at the end of verse 21 that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, you see what I mean? There is no existence in the gray. You're either worshiping God or the self, idolatry. You're either living in the light of life or you're dying in the darkness of death. If these habits, choices, and lifestyles are the fruit of the flesh, and everything is as binary as it seems, what then are the fruits or the evidence of walking and living in the Spirit? There's one thing that we have to understand before we proceed. Truth can be understood as factual statements concerning reality. Okay? God is the ultimate source of truth. Jesus claimed to be the embodiment of truth. Therefore, reality is defined by God. This is incredibly important in understanding the upside down, which exists as a false reality, a fake 
reality. One could use the word fantasy. And of course, this is almost exclusively the view of the Abrahamic faiths. Postmodernism suggests that reality is, you know, it's just shaped by our perceptions and experiences and interpretations, that it's subjective and influenceable. Okay, so now we understand that God is the ultimate reality. One of my favorite Bible verses is in Acts chapter 17. Paul and Silas had been evangelizing and then discipling in Thessalonica, and they were staying at the house of a man named Jason, who hosted the Christian church there, like the church met in Jason's house. And then Luke writes in Acts 17, 5 through 6, but the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them, the Christians, out to the people. When they didn't find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before, before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here. The King James Version says, These that have turned the world upside down. They're talking about the Christians. The Christians had caused so many problems for the Jewish leaders. It was as if the world had been turned upside down. But we've come to realize quite obviously that the world is already upside down, which means that these Christians are actually, when, when, when it says that they're turning the world over, it actually means that they're turning it right side up. And this is why I say not to lose heart and, and not to give up. It's our job. It's our duty to flip as much as possible right side up. To escape the upside down ourselves and bring as many people with us as possible. Which means turning institutions over, back to where they should be. It means defeating certain ide ideologies. It means moral victories. It means bringing us back to reality. So now the question is, what is the opposite of the upside down? Well, getting back to Galatians chapter 5, Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Again, with these evidences or outcomes or fruit, this list isn't exhaustive either. There are more things that we could talk about and list here, but for whatever reason, Paul only listed these nine things. The fruit of the Spirit is another way of saying this is the evidence of God's work and presence in the life of a believer. This, this is what happens when a person abides in Christ. This is what happens when a person does not live according to every desire and whim of their flesh. And he begins with love. This is the word agape. Okay? And this is one of those instances when the simplicity of English under-translates the Greek. Agape is distinct from eros, which is romantic or passionate love, or philia, that's familial or friendship love, brotherly love. Agape is godly, unconditional love. Loving those who are not easy to love or who won't reciprocate. In the Gospels, this, is, this word is used interchangeably to describe the love of God toward us and the love that Christians should exhibit toward each other. When Paul was writing to spouses in the book of Ephesians, he specifically instructed the husband to agape his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love is a core characteristic of living in reality, but hate is its inversion in the upside down. This is why love has been perverted to mean affirmation and acceptance of sin, a celebration of wrong. This is why we have phrases like, love wins, 
and a progressive embrace of the Rainbow Club's perverse tendencies and habitual lifestyles. This inversion of love into hatred is why so many in the world are hostile toward the Jewish people. It's why racism is rampant in America, and if you consistently watch this show, you know what I mean by that. The spiritual fruit of agape love is the characteristic trait of those who live in reality. That opposite of of the hatred that exists in the upside down. Joy is the next trait. This is the Greek word kara, and it means delight or gladness. But it's difficult for us to separate the true definition of the joy of the Spirit from the false joy that's given to us by the God of this world. Joy is not happiness. This is properly understood to be the awareness of God's grace and favor. It's something that comes from God. All of this does. But joy is something that comes from God. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from anything in the world. It doesn't come from circumstance like happiness does. Happiness is entirely rooted in circumstance. This is happening. It makes me happy. This is beautifully illustrated by Paul in the book of Acts and in the epistles. In Romans 5, Paul talks about rejoicing in suffering. Peter said the same thing in his letters. Joy is something totally unworldly. It doesn't make any sense in this world. The the opposite of joy, though, and, and that which defines the upside down, are things like depression and misery. We have skyrocketing levels of depression and anxiety. Misery is a, is like a lifestyle for those who live in the upside down. And this is because we're out of touch with reality, which is to say that we're out of touch with God. And I'm not talking about genuine cases of clinical depression. I'm talking about a severely sour lack of both joy and happiness as a result of being detached from reality or living in the upside down. Peace is the next word. This is the Greek word irene, and it means oneness, rest, welfare, and peace. But again, This isn't peace derived from this world. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. So all of these things come from God. That means that God's peace doesn't just speak to being, you know, without problems or disputes or disunity with others. It first and foremost describes peace with God. When we're living according to the Spirit and we're not walking in the flesh, there's no sin that's separating us from God. And this is peace between God and myself. This this peace between us is only possible because, because of the sacrificial atonement of Christ. He's the one who paved this path to peace with God. But flowing out from this peace between God and myself, it extends to unity and harmony with my fellow believers. So if you want to see a church who is filled with the Spirit look no further than its relationships. And just as an aside, this peaceful unity is actually something that must precede revival. Tozer once wrote, Revival comes to those who have, through repentance and faith, brought their hearts into one accord. What does this mean? Well, it doesn't doesn't just refer to settling interpersonal conflict Paul described unity within the body of Christ as something that existed mentally. So we not only need to confess our sins to one another and and forgive one another, we have to iron out the theological creases. That means we have to eliminate false doctrine and false prophecy because these are cause for great disunity in the body of Christ. When these lies are defeated and conflicts are squashed, Then and only then may the bride of Christ know peace among its parts. Now, the opposite of this divine peace is discord and division. And you see a lot of these things in in this list of fleshly attributes which so define those detached from reality in the upside down. This is why America is the most divided it's been since maybe the Civil War, if not ever. 
Next is patience. This is the word makrothomia. And really, the, the better word is what the King James Version used, and that is long-suffering. One word, long-suffering. It means being slow to anger. It avoids the premature use of force that arises from sinful anger. Another older term is steadfastness, which is like staying power or resoluteness. A modern explanation of this spiritual patience would be that one is long-tempered as opposed to short-tempered. And the first four fruits, as as with the rest, can all somewhat culminate together. Long-suffering is like the staying power of love and joy and peace that only comes from God. They last. Martin Luther once said, Long-suffering is that quality which enables a person to bear adversity, injury, reproach, and makes them patient to wait for the improvement of those who have done him wrong. So the opposite of this must be impatience and agitation, two more central traits in American society and the upside down. Kindness is the word Christotes, and it's not at all to be confused with niceness. A lot of people give me funny looks and criticism when I say that Jesus wasn't nice. But there's a massive difference between being nice and being biblically kind. Again, this is the fruit of the Spirit of God. This is how God behaves toward us. The Bible tells us it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. How is this distinct and detached from niceness? Well, kindness is rooted in genuine care, genuine care, empathy, and good will toward others. It's totally sincere. Niceness involves just being polite and pleasant and agreeable, but can totally lack genuineness and sincerity. That means that kindness is authentic while niceness is superficial and fake. The opposite of this divine characteristic of kindness is cruelty or simply indifference. And these things are all too common in American society. Goodness is the word agathosune, and it's closely related to kindness, but speaks mostly to the generosity associated with kindness. It's not simply describing righteousness, like being good or righteous, but this is how God is with us. God is so unbelievably good to us. He's so generous in giving to us. He's beneficent and benevolent. So the Christian is to be beneficent and benevolent to others. He is good, kind, and generous to others for their genuine welfare. The opposite of this, and a defining trait of the upside down, is maliciousness. And this speaks to the selfishness, the animosity, the hostility, and ill will, which is characteristic of walking according to the flesh, living in the upside down. Faithfulness is next, and this is the word pistis. It's the word that gets translated to faith over and over and over in Scripture, and it means to be persuaded. Contextually, this would mean divine persuasion. Therefore, if if you have faith, trust, or reliance, or belief in God, you have this by way of His providence. Secularly, in Greco-Roman culture, this word referred to a, a warranty or a guarantee. And, and this was at a time when your word actually meant something. It was your bond. So this not only refers to someone who has faith in God, it also refers to the Christian who can be counted on as reliable. You have faith and you are faithful. Both of these are traits of the person who is walking with God. The opposite is actually the unpardonable sin of unbelief, and relationally it manifests as disloyalty. These things lend themselves to idolatry in our relationship to God, the ultimate reality, and to all sorts of relational messiness with others. This is why you have growing atheism in one sense and the growing fashionable trend of divorce in the other. Gentleness is the Greek word perutes, and this is one of my favorite qualities of Christ. It means mildness and gentleness, but another biblical word that we use is meekness. This describes gentle strength, which in our modern thinking seems contradictory. 
but it expresses power with reserve and gentleness. Gentle force is another way of saying it. You could use, you could also use the word humility here, but Jesus embodied this better than anyone else. He has all the power and strength in the universe, yet he was a gentle force that could not be stopped, not spiritually. William Barclay describes spiritual gentleness as the quality of the man who was always angry at the right time and never at the wrong time. It means not having a superior attitude. It isn't timidity or passiveness. It's the reservation and control of power and might. And I absolutely love it. Theologian Leon Morris said, It is important for Christians to see that the self-assertiveness that is so much part of the 20th century life should not be valued highly. It is much better that each of us curtails the desire to be preeminent and exercises a proper meekness or gentleness. So the opposite quality is roughness or brashness and arrogance. And finally, we have self-control. This is the word enkratia and can be described as self-mastery and and self-restraint. Self-control is the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites, by the power of God. The opposite of this is hedonism, just doing whatever you feel like doing, doing whatever makes you feel good, following your heart's every desire, which is to say satisfying every desire of the flesh. And this is, quite frankly, the motto for the Upside Down. And it's no coincidence that the motto for the satanic church is do what thou wilt, which is to say do whatever you want. In order to right the ship or turn our society right side up, as the Christians in Thessalonica had done, we must first turn the church right side up. The church has to be the first to abandon the practices and ideologies of the upside down before American society can be corrected. Because here's the deal. Okay, don't miss this. Fruit is attractive. When Christians bear the fruit of the Spirit, when we're loving and joyous and peaceful and patient, it is attractive and alluring to those in the upside down. So, Clearly, it starts with us abandoning life in the flesh as we adhere exclusively to the life in the Spirit. This is so poignantly described to King Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We talked about this weeks ago, but it bears repeating. The festering growth of the upside down lies almost squarely at the feet of a church in America who has failed to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Listen to what God, the ultimate reality, says to Solomon and to us today, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people and my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So here is God giving Solomon step-by-step directions on how to turn things around. And it begins with humbling ourselves, Christians. We have to get off of our our moral high horses, admit to our sins, admit our failures, and, and humble ourselves. But unfortunately, we're incapable by ourselves of fixing everything that's, that's broken and, and what we've allowed to be broken, honestly. So that takes us to, to step two, which is to pray and seek His face. That's to pray according to the will of God, to put God first. And then the next and final step, step three, which is arguably the most important, is repentance. Christians have to stop sinning. We have to stop walking according to the flesh, like that list that we looked at in Galatians 5. We have to start living righteously, walking in the Spirit, which means to be set apart. That's holiness. 
And that's usually the total opposite of how the world conducts itself, if you want some sort of gauge. I'm not saying that Christians can be perfect people. I'm talking about laying aside the old man and anything that easily ensnares us. I'm talking about the metaphorical cutting off a hand or plucking out an eye to keep from stumbling into hell, which means taking drastic steps to avoid sin and temptation. And I'm telling you that this is impossible to do alone. We have to do this as a community. That's what the church is for. You have to have someone to walk alongside you in your journey toward Christ-likeness. Sanctification. We have to confess our sins to one another and, and institute the most severe boundaries we've ever dreamed of. That's the only way that you can effectively turn from wickedness with permanence. So when we've done those three things, when we've humbled, our, humbled ourselves, prayed desperately to the Lord, and we've repented, then and only then will God hear us, forgive us, and restore the United States of America. The repentance that you see described there is the act of riding the ship or turning the upside down into the right side up. And it begins with you. As an individual soul, bringing yourself back to God. When we've done that collectively, that's when the church experiences revival. Or the body of Christ is, is then right side up. And then God's holy church stands its most powerful chance of turning America right side up. Thank you for watching today. I want to make sure that you stay informed on the news and the biblical response to it. So please do yourself and us a favor and hit the subscribe button before you go. And then we'd also love for you to check out wethefreeshow.com to grab yourself some merch to help spread the word of We The Free. And right now we're going to put a video on the screen that we think that you'll love. So now go and be that salt and light and we'll see you next time.